I must say, this was the absolute perfect segue into the next topic, uh, because the topic is going to be the region and what's happening right now in the Middle East, and especially in what used to be the Ottoman Empire. So, just to connect the previous talk to this next one, is that ultimately we all want to understand what will bring peace. And I argue that we need two things to ultimately work together. The first is what I talked about in the previous lecture. We will need the two peoples themselves to go through the process of mutual recognition and acceptance that they can't have what they want. They will have to settle for what they can get. But I think as important, if not more important, is what happens in the region. And the reason that the region is important, and even the world, is that contrary to the intense amount of attention that our conflict gets, it's actually one of the least important and least violent conflicts in the world. It's, uh, I don't know, if you, in terms of numbers, if you want to be crude for a moment, the numbers of everyone Arabs on all sides, countries, Egyptians, Jordanians, Iraqis, Palestinians, and Jews, killed as a result of violent conflict between them over 120 years and more of the conflict, 130 years, it's about 100,000. Think about everything that's happened in the 20th century. Think about what's happening in the Middle East now. I recently read a leak table of violent conflicts in the world of the present era, our conflict was number 49. So if you are someone in the world who cares about alleviating suffering and ensuring that there are no conflicts, there are 48 other conflicts that you should be working on rather than this one. So it's a very small conflict, but because it's a very small conflict, it is just the right size for everyone to intervene in. So it's a conflict that always had the flavor of whatever happened in the world at the time. Colonial struggles, the Cold War, the end of history of the 90s, which is why we were close to making peace at the time, the rise of Islamic fundamentalism, and currently, the unraveling of the region. So what is actually happening in the region? And it's been quite remarkable, let me tell you, to perceive it from the vantage point of our state of Israel in the last few years. Because living in Israel in the last few years has been like living in the eye of a storm. Now, as I'm sure you know, the eye of a storm has a very specific characteristic. It's very calm. Inside the eye of the storm, it's very calm. All around you, the storm is raging. But inside, in the middle, it's calm. It's eerily calm, but calm. And this has been Israel for the last few years. A storm has been raging around us, but somehow within Israel, it's been calm. And this is, by the way, also true for the West Bank. It's been remarkably, eerily calm. Now what's happening around us, the storm that is taking our region, was basically, I like to call it, the Ottoman spring, a hundred years delayed. Basically what we're seeing happening in the region that used to be part, used to be the areas of the Ottoman Empire, is what would have probably happened if the victorious French and British after World War I had not intervened to carve up the carcass of the Ottoman Empire to create the states of the modern Middle East. The amazing thing is that when we think about a world order, we typically think about post-World War II. But in the Middle East, the war that mattered was World War I. World War II was not so important. 
World War I is the war that shaped the modern Middle East. And literally a hundred years later, all of that is unraveling. I was recently in a talk, giving a talk about Israel. And my hosts, before my talk, they gave maps on people's desks. And the map was the classic map of small Israel in the big Middle East and all the Arab countries around us. And I remember opening my talk saying, I'm looking at this map and a wave of nostalgia is coming all over me because nothing in this map is true anymore. There's no Iraq and there's no Syria and there's no Libya and countries are holding themselves together around this region barely. Everything is coming apart. Now, why is this the autumn and spring, a hundred years delay? Think about what we like to call the European Spring of Nations. 1848, young people go to the squares calling for more democracy, more social justice, more accountability, self-determination. That was 1848. Now jump to Europe of 1948. You want to include Europe, Eastern Europe, jump to 1998. Those young people in the squares were remarkably successful. They got more democracy than they ever imagined. They got more social justice than they could ever imagine. They got self-determinations for their peoples. The only small problem, of course, is that the 100 and 150 years between 1848 and 1948, 1848 and 1998, were some of the most brutal and bloody in human history. And the things are not unrelated. When you're trying to move from an old order to a new order, it doesn't happen smoothly. It doesn't happen nicely. It is always bloody and violent. And what we are seeing now is what happened in the areas of the Russian and Soviet empire, the Austro-Hungarian empire, the British, the French, all the empires that were dissolved Ultimately, you had fighting and violence between the peoples of the dissolved empire. And the same would have happened to the Ottoman Empire if the French and the British did not carve out a map of the Middle East. But this is what's happening right now. So a hundred years later, during those hundred years, the artificial states carved by the British and the French were held together by despots, by kings, by autocrats, and by legendary sums of money. But now all of that is gone. And what we're seeing for the first time in a hundred years is authentic. Now authentic doesn't mean nice. It doesn't mean friendly. But for the first time in a very long time, it is the peoples of the Middle East who are speaking. They are battling to shape the future of the region. And I would say that if this takes less than a hundred years, we should count ourselves lucky. And if at the end of the hundred years, we actually have a Middle East of democracy and social justice and self-determination, we should count ourselves even luckier. But it's not going to be shorter than that. Any notion that we're entering a short period of troubles should be let go of. We're entering a long, extended period of reshaping this region, the region that used to belong to the Ottoman Empire, based on the peoples of the empire. And this is going to be brutal and violent for a very long time. And it also means that the players, it's no longer the United States and the Soviet Union, the British and French empire. The important players are now the local players. Turkey, Iran, to some extent, Saudi Arabia and Egypt, even though 
They too are battling for their future in this region. These are mid-sized powers defending their interests, seeking to shape the region. Even Russia, it's no longer the Soviet Union. Russia is back to being a mid-sized power in the region with specific interests to defend. And the choices that are being faced by the actors are all bad choices. When the whole Syria event started, remember how much hope people had for Assad as a reformer? People were so impressed that he's a doctor and that he knows English and that his wife is beautiful and buys on eBay. And somehow we thought that this means that there's a progressive future out there. But when Syria started to dissolve, Assad, who belongs to a small ethnic minority, the Alawites, who are considered by almost the entire Muslim world as heretics, he knew that he faces a very simple choice, butcher or be butchered. Very simple. So he chose to butcher rather than to be butchered. That's it. There was no option of openness, democracy, smooth transition. Maybe several decades, a century from now, not now. And I know that this offends our progressive sensibilities. Really? It still matters? Sect, religion, tribe? But these are incredibly powerful forces. You saw them in Yugoslavia. And with all due respect, these were the most powerful forces in Europe for centuries. The peaceful Europe that you see today was bought at a very, very high price. These loyalties to tribe, to sect, to religion, to nation, they matter to people. They were held under a pressure cooker for about a century, but the lid is off. And now you're seeing all these forces battling for supremacy in the region. So what does this mean for Israel, given that this is what our region is going to look like for a very long time? My prescription for Israel is to be Switzerland. Now, Switzerland is typically not the country you think of when you think about Israel. But if you're Swiss, for many centuries, the way Europe looked to Switzerland was much worse than the way that the Middle East looks today to us now. Now, it's true, the Swiss have the Alp Mountains. We don't. We will have to rely on our military, on our technology. But we need to do the same basic thing, which I call to be a neutral bunker. We need to be neutral in the sense that we have no dog in the fight in the Middle East. We should not be for this side or that side or the other side. The notion that the enemy of my enemy is my friend is not relevant in the current Middle East. The enemy of my enemy is my enemy is my enemy. Nobody right now in the Middle East is a big fan of us. The Kurds, they like us, that's true. The Christians increasingly understand that we're in the same boat. But fundamentally, we don't have real allies. We might have temporary allies to defend ourselves and our borders. But in terms of our values, of who we are, of our vision, it's going to be a long way before we wake up one morning and Israel is not just the only democracy in the Middle East, but the first democracy in the Middle East. I can assure you that the day that we wake up and we are surrounded by liberal democracies in all directions that respect women's rights and minority rights is the day we will have made peace so quickly we won't know why it took us so long but that will take a while. So we need to be neutral in this fight. We are not a Turkey or an Iran or a Saudi Arabia that seeks to shape the region. 
We need to defend ourselves. And that's the other part. During that entire time, we need to be a bunker. It means that our military and our leadership have one goal. That is to prevent the insanity of what goes on around us from entering our borders. This is the only thing for a very long time. Just make sure this doesn't enter our borders. And this is the guarantee we have so that we can continue to live in this eye of a storm. A lot of people ask me, I don't know if you've had a chance to visit Israel recently and to go to the Golan Heights. It's actually creepy. You stand on the Golan Heights, on one side of it, you can go and sip wine in a beautiful winery, and on the other side, there is a violent, bloody, civil war, butchery taking place. And, pe and you can see it with your own eyes. And people are asking me, how can you live in Israel these days knowing everything that goes on around you? And I always say, denial. Denial is the key to living in Israel these days. It is the key to our ability to go and enjoy the beautiful days on the beach in Tel Aviv. Because if we really recognize how fragile the situation is, well, that's not something you can go day on day realizing how difficult it is. This is why we outsource the job of worrying to our prime minister, to our defense minister, to our politicians. They're the ones who should not be sleeping at night so that we can sleep at night. But, but this is really what we're facing right now. And we have to be a neutral bunker for a very long time until finally the region around us somehow resolves itself. And the thing is this, I know so many people want to do something. They want to shape the region. They want to help the good guys. But it's not really clear who the good guys are. And the ability to do something is very limited. I argue that one of the biggest challenges to the United States right now in the region is actually coming to terms with impotence to understand how little it can do to shape outcome. Maybe it can prevent some of the worst outcomes, but even that is a question mark. So this is the region we're facing. I will, it is mostly a place of intense danger for us, but there are some opportunities. And the opportunities emerge first from the understanding that certain dangers have disappeared. The possibility of Israel being attacked by militaries is gone. But also, what we might find is that our neighbors, the Jordanians, the Palestinians, as they look east and south, and north will say to themselves, the Jews aren't so bad. Given how insane and crazy the Middle East is, it's better for us to have the military protection of Israel, to be in alliance with Israel, than to be against it. And from that, an opportunity could emerge. I don't know if you call it peace, I don't know if you call it some understandings, but ultimately this might create some opportunities for something. Some ad hoc alliances with countries who feel endangered like us by Iran, by the Islamic State. All of these will create opportunities. I don't know if for peace in the way we thought of it in the 90s with the rainbows and balloons and the doves being released, but arrangements that will allow all of us to somehow weather the storm for the next few decades, a century or more, that it might last. So, if we are to have peace one day, a lot depends on us, the Israelis, 
the Palestinians on our ability to finally give up on what we want for what we can get. What Professor Dejani calls giving up on the big dream for the little hope. But a lot of it ultimately depends on the fact that we will find ourselves in a region that makes it possible to accept Israel as an ally, as a force for good, for defense, for survival, rather than a foreigner and an enemy. And if I'm to, pre to present a very long vision, if everyone is going back to their sect, to their religion, to their tribe, maybe our big chance here is to remind the peoples of the Middle East that the Jewish people are as much a tribe of the Middle East as any of the other tribes. And therefore, we, our tribe, ask for our own opportunity for a state while all the other tribes are seeking their own sense of who they are, their place, and self-determination. So thank you for this. And... Um, I think we have some time again for questions. You can also have questions from before, from the previous session, and that's fine. Yes.